Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the CTE Foundation. It is the month, it's CTE month, and we are gonna to start today with a webinar with an amazing panel of experts and have a conversation today about transformation and the best models in education. So I'm Lisa Whitby Schaffner. I am very lucky to be able to serve on the CTE board on the Sonoma County Board of Education and run an education foundation called the John Jordan Foundation. So I definitely have skin on the game in this issue. I um, believe today that you are going to find this very informative and I'd ask you to go right to the chat as you have questions and we will try and get those answered. Anything that's not answered, I, uh, we will make sure we get those answered through the different staff members. We're hoping to get to everything, but if not, we will get you the answers you need. So why workforce? is so important and I, I'm, I learned this longer uh, later in my life than I wanted to it running a business organization there was always a disconnect between schools and business I felt like business didn't know how to interact with schools that is changing and you're going to hear today why that's changing I think governments now truly understand that the workforce impacts their budgets and if the workforce isn't great in coming out of the schools um, then the budget doesn't go up so i think everybody is finally understanding these connections that have to be made so thrilled to be here there's great partnerships happening in sonoma county and um, we're also going to hear about some partnerships in other areas that we could use to um, strengthen. And we have great people here offering to help us do our work. So I am gonna turn it over to the experts and start with Kathy Goodacre, our amazing CEO of the CTE Foundation and um, let's get going. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. And uh, truly we are the lucky one uh, to have you be such a strong leader and representative in this community, both through your foundation work at John Jordan Foundation, uh, on the school board and on the many boards that you serve, uh, championing for education and children, and most importantly, recognizing why these school partnerships, the education alignment and partnerships are so critical to ensure our students' success and also supporting workforce and economic development. So I'm going to get on to the panelists here in just a moment, but first just to share a little bit about why. Why for CTE Foundation? Yes, this is CTE Month na nationally, and we're excited to celebrate that uh, every week this month with different topics. But what is our why around education partnerships and our why around the importance of, of students um, getting into the right post-secondary education and training out of high school? We believe all students benefit from career-connected learning. We know students are hungry for engagement and obviously even more so through distance learning in, in our uh, previous year that we've experienced but they also are seeking relevance. And in order to help them see that relevance, they need career connected learning and something to be excited about for their future. So we believe that by providing this exposure and career awareness and helping them see those connections that they were gonna be more successful in their post-secondary education, in their careers and in life. And the other part of it is, we need to build our local workforce. We have to support economic development and that means jobs. And that means helping young people get on the right pathway, helping them understand what are those careers in our community that are high scale, high demand and high wage. So having that connection and work-based learning experiences so that they can really see their path through education and training out of high school and landing some of those great careers we can really help grow our own here in Sonoma County in this region. So on to our panel. We have four uh, fabulous experts that we've assembled for you today. And I'm gonna ask each of them as um, if you would in the chat to our panelists, share with the folks who are uh, watching this, your name, your title, an email contact for yourself, as well as a web link to either the organization or the subject you're speaking on today. So that in your introduction, um, they'll see that in the chat. And instead, I'm gonna ask as we introduce each of you um, to share a little bit insight about either yourself or your organization or your commitment to this work. And to kick that off, um, I'm gonna start with Robert Curtis. And Robert, we're very excited to have you here. 
uh, with Link Learning Alliance and uh, going to kick off with Robert so that he can really set the framework around that what is it about work-based learning and education partnerships as a model and a tool that uh, will help students um, be more successful. So Robert, my question for you, if you would share, why was it important for you to be here today? What is, is it that you really want to share um, in one or two sentences, if you can, please, as your introduction? Great. Thanks, Kathy. Do you want our videos on, by the way, or not? I know I, it's the... Yes, we do. We want to see you. Great. Okay. Just got enabled. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me here today. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. And in one or two sentences, I think um, I'm here because a lot of the conversations I'm engaged in is really anchored around, you know, what is the purpose of education? Like, wh wh why? <laughs> and, and really rethinking that. I think it's critical that we, as we engage in this question um, anew right now, um, that we don't just limit it to our educators and our students think about that, that we really need to engage other key stakeholders, including our post-secondary uh, and partners in the workforce. Because I think as we grapple with you know, the new in issues and the issues that have continued around really serving all students well, I think we can't do it without other partners. And I think Einstein, Albert Einstein said, no problem can be solved with the same level of consciousness that created it. And I think that um, we really need each other to really rethink what we're trying to do with education um, right now. So that's, that's why I'm here in the room and, and glad to be here with you, so. You're on mute, famous fast last words. Um, thank you, Robert. We're very excited to have you here and to have you as a partner in Sonoma County. Uh, Diane, if you will uh, share with us, what is it that drives your commitment to this work in education and for students? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy CTE month. Um, Kathy and everyone, I think what really drives me is just a passion for helping students succeed. Uh, I came to teaching after 15 years as a, an attorney, don't shoot me, and really wanted to see students who are interested in pursuing that profession or any other trade or, or business be able to do that and have the tools available to make them successful. And working with the community to facilitate that just gets me up every morning and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent, Diane. Thank you again for being here. And um, fortunately, you didn't, you didn't have to travel far today to be part of this panel. Um, next up, I'm gonna ask Allie. If Allie, you would introduce yourself and I know you've already done that in the chat. But if all planets were to align, what would be the greatest outcome you might envision for your students as they leave your high school? Um, that's such a good question. And I appreciate that. You know, and I, you asked us to kind of think about our why. And so it's been going around in my head. And if I think about my why and what my ideal outcome would be, it's that a person's zip code and my students zip code would not inform their destiny. And that's what my ideal outcome would be. It shouldn't be about the, shouldn't be about where we live and it shouldn't be about the resources our parents necessarily have or don't have. Um, it should be about who we are as people and all of the amazing opportunities that exist in this world and making sure that we connect our kids so that their zip code does not inform their destiny. That's really, really great. Thank you, Allie. We look forward to your uh, comments later. And Vanessa from SRJC, um, what's the one takeaway you hope that our participants and viewers today uh, will take away uh, from today's presentation? Well, thank you, Kathy and CTE Foundation for having me here today. I feel very honored to be in such great company. And I'm filled with enthusiasm um, to be here as I transition into this new position at SRJC that will be developing dual enrollment pathways and partnerships. So what I'm hoping is that I'm able to gain some allies and some champions in this work um, here in the community. You know, I've been really honored and privileged to um, really see the power the, of the transformative power of education from middle school, college to high school over the past two decades. And I'm a big believer in how education um, can be a great tool in equity 
And so I'm really committed, um, if not addicted, to breaking down barriers in education. And so that's what my work um, really is um, about. And that's what I'm hoping to share and um, bring you all on board. That's outstanding. We're really excited to have you in that position at SRJC. So now I'm going to kick it off uh, or move on to our panel presentation. And we will start with Robert Curtis from Link Learning Alliance, who will share, uh, be able to share his screen now. Can you all hear me and see the screen? Yes. Yes, great. Uh, well, thanks again for uh, letting me be here. Just to you know, anchor um, the current moment um, and uh, give a little bit of background. Um, you know, we do have an education crisis. Is why I think we really need to rethink the purpose of education uh, and what we're doing. And I think COVID has just highlighted a lot of the inequities that have you know really been part of our educational system for uh, a long time. Uh, you know, right now, less than 20% of high school students of color, Black and Latinx, graduate ready for college. And by the year 2030, California will face a shortage of 1.1 million workers um, holding a bachelor's degree. And I think this is even more so now as students uh, with distance learning and COVID have actually, actually a lot more power and they can choose whether to show up or not. Um, and we're having a lot of challenges with students not showing up um, and really um, failing at incredible rates throughout the state right now and, and looking at learning loss. Um, but we're also finding it's an opportunity where students are actually learning a lot, we're just not able to capture it because sometimes they aren't showing up and it's not happening in the regular traditional classroom. So um, all of these lead to a real challenge for us at, at the moment. Um, and as I said, COVID-19 is exasperating the crisis. 22% fewer high school graduates are enrolling in college. 30% fewer low-income high school graduates enrolling in college, and 16% fewer common applications are first-generation and low-income students. And one in four students uh, ages 16 to 24 are estimated to be disconnected from school and work in 2020. Whoops, sorry, there we go. So um, I work for the Link Learning Alliance and uh, I'm a former high school science teacher and basketball coach. I've been a site and district administrator, I've worked at county offices and now I'm at a nonprofit uh, that's really focused on college and career and community readiness. Um, so we really see that as a key uh, solution to the issues we have in terms of how we rethink education. And we think it can't just be uh, with our K-12 educators and teachers um, working on this problem. We really need a more collective effort to, to come up with a better solution. So part of our solution is this thing called a link learning approach, which really has four key components. One is uh, really integrating rigorous academics for, with career technical education and not having these things be separate. We need folks that are prepared for college and career when they come out of uh, high school. We also believe that work-based learning needs to be an integral part of the high school and really the K-12 experience. And when I say work-based learning, I mean everything from career awareness to career exploration to career preparation. And this includes things like guest speakers, job shadows, uh, mock interviews, and internships that are embedded as part of what students do in school um, so that we're bringing relevancy into school and not having students having to leave the school to get relevancy. And then the last piece is really integrated student supports. And this includes uh, things such as early college credit, which I think you'll hear a lot more about um, as we go through the sessions today from some of the other speakers. Um, link learning, we, uh, this is something that's been funded uh, for about 10 years now. Uh, it's an initiative that with nine California districts, it's actually grown to over uh, 25 districts nationally and has had a 10 year study looking at the results of link learning and this approach when we integrate these components. And here are some of the results we've seen, increased graduation and decreased dropouts, more students that are college ready, uh, really uh, greater success in some of the key skills that we think are important today uh, and, in the, and for jobs tomorrow. Strong effects on who enters high school, uh, stronger effects for students who enter high school uh, with low achievement being su successful in post-secondary. And we really think that the, the, that 
uh, quality matters, that it's not just doing these things individually and at a low level, but really having high quality CT, high quality work-based learning, and a really thoughtful and intentional approach to things like early college credit where kids are getting college credit well in high school. And another piece that we really uh, believe strongly, as, as you probably alluded to earlier, is that uh, partnerships matter. And this is partnerships between educators and employers, partnerships between our practitioners and policymakers at the state and national level, uh, and partnerships between the students and teachers and parents uh, and schools and community-based organizations and high school and post-secondary. And that we really need to do this at scale. It can't be random initiatives happening here and there that, that we're not leveraging and growing. So we really think this needs to be a systemic approach. Um, and that's why I think it takes, it, takes a, it takes a village to really do this work. Uh, so a couple of last pieces here. So again, these are three of our uh, key components and we have some standards that we use with educators and these have been informed with, by community partners and our post-secondary partners and workforce around what this can look like for students and, and what the results can mean. And then I wanna end here with a student. Uh, this is a student from one of our link learning pathways that um, actually has got gold certified. Um, and I'll just leave it on the screen here and let you read that, or maybe I should read it for folks who can't see it. Um, this is a beautiful shield. She was a sophomore at Royal Valley High School and this is, she was in it, their Academy for Business and Logistics. She said, my experience in the Business and Logistics Academy has benefited me by allowing me to have work-based learning opportunities many do not have the chance to get, including be, being able to enroll in business courses at San Bernardino Valley College. I look forward to continuing these academic experiences for years to come. Uh, she actually graduated with seven and a half credits of, of post-secondary credits um, and is well on her way to being uh, prepared for, for post-secondary success. Um, she's also had a great chance to engage with not only uh, getting you know, going to, to explore colleges, but also getting to do job shadows and she had a paid internship. So um, this was two years ago. So uh, this is just one example. And I think uh, the reason I do this work is really to have impact on, on students. And this is uh, one student. So I think you'll hear more about that in the next presentation. So let's see. Okay. I think that's it here, Kathy. So I think the next one is Diane, correct? Yes, so Diane, um, welcome again. And uh, we're very excited to hear what's happening at Antelope Valley Union School District. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. So on the uh, next slide through, you will see, um, just one more, you will see a little bit about our school district and some things that Allie said and that uh, Vanessa said really resonated with me. We have uh, about 21,000 students. We have approximately 71% of our students are low socioeconomic, which means that they are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. And we have eight high schools in our area pretty much at the very northernmost end of Los Angeles County. And one of those is an early college high school where students are actually on the campus of Antelope Valley College. They can get both their high school diploma and their associate's degree at the same time. So as far as our demographics of race and ethnicity, our district student population is 65% Hispanic Latino, 19% African American, 12% white, 4% Asian Pacific Islander, 1% American Indian Alaska Native, and less than 1% unknown or unclassified. So I believe that we, we have a lot in common with um, many of the lower performing areas around the state, but we still have many advantages. So if we can go on to the next slide, our district has 10 career themed academies across our comprehensive sites, as well as CTE course sequences at both our high school and junior high sites. Two of the junior highs feed into two of our academies. Two of our academies are certified as Link Learning Gold, as Robert has mentioned, with an additional one is Silver, and others are on the pathway to become Silver in the coming year. Several of our academies are also recognized as California Partnership Academy Distinguished Academies. Now to tell you a little bit about articulation and how it works in our district, 
Um, our district was established in 1912 in what was then a very rural area at the time, much more urban now, but still ex-urban of Los Angeles. And in 1929, Antelope Valley College was formed by actually by our high school district as a way for its graduates to continue their education in the area. And so the close relationship with the college was formed obviously very early on. In fact, it wasn't until 1961 that the community college formed its own district. What is articulation, you may ask? Um, an articulation agreement allows students to gain college credit for successfully completing an equivalent high school course. And we first implemented that in the late 1980s under the Title V credit by exam provisions. Um, it's grown over the years, and we currently have about 35 high school courses which are articulated and approximately 2,500 students annually who are eligible for college credit at ABC under the agreement. My current position with the district, I started as a teacher and became an administrator, um, got this position about five years ago as part of our linked learning work. And as Robert mentioned, those coordinated student supports, really knowing how important it is for students to be able to have a variety of opportunities available. So um, it's kind of obvious from my title, which is about a mile long, I understand a large part of my work is to continue to cultivate and grow the relationship with ABC and other post-secondary institutions for the benefit of our students and programs, including both articulation, as I mentioned, and dual enrollment opportunities. Now, dual enrollment is a little bit different under AB 288, which started in 2015, is another way for students to gain early college credit while still in high school. And under dual enrollment, students are enrolled in college courses, which are taught on our high school campus by adjunct professors who are also our high school teachers. The students who successfully complete get both college and high school credit for the courses. And currently we have trigonometry and pre-calculus because we wanted those students to be able to continue on to more advanced courses. The demographics of the students in those courses are very similar to our district demographic. 58% Hispanic, 8% African American, 18% white, 9% Asian in 1920. We're still in the first couple of years of expanding that program in our district. So we hope that it will continue to grow and reflect our district population. Now, why would students participate? This slide really points it out. Some of the most important elements of participation in articulation and dual enrollment programs for students are through exposure to college curriculum and experiences that inspire self-confidence and a self sense of self-efficacy. I do, and I can give you a little bit of data, Wendell, and uh, is that Wendy? Wendell, in just a few moments. Um, they learn, they implement the skills that will make them successful in post-secondary along with gaining the subject matter proficiency. So as you'll see in the slides here, um, this one and the next one, the research tends to show that students who gain college credit while they're still in high school are generally more persistent in completing post-secondary and remaining in high school as they see a more seamless pathway to their career and life goals. These courses help students move ahead more quickly in their chosen fields of study, which is really helpful, helpful for our local workforce development effort. Um, we provide a pool of well-qualified workers for our regional employers in engineering, healthcare, and many other sectors. So importantly, from an equity and access point of view, the students are not charged to take part in these courses. So they not only save time by getting a head start on their college course requirements, but they also save money for themselves and their families without negatively impacting their later financial aid. And this just shows an example of what those cost savings might be. A number of our CTE pathways and academies provide opportunities for students to gain anywhere from three to over 15 units of articulation credit. And the two dual enrollment courses provide seven units of college credit. This is in addition to any advanced placement or international baccalaureate courses that students may take part in that could give them college credit upon passing the exam. And our district actually offers AP exams for $5 each. They normally cost 90 to $95 each. So you can see that that's really an important benefit for our students. So if we can get to this uh, next slide, that just shows a bit about the research. 
Obviously, it helps students save time, saves money, they're better prepared. And then one additional slide. Um, we also have a success story that we'd like to pass on, and Robert will be providing a link to some resources. You'll learn a little bit more about Prishna Martinez, who's a senior at our Palmdale High School Health Careers Academy. She is currently uh, has six college credits, and by the time she graduates in June, she will have 17 and a half or 18 units of college credit because of articulation. So this is a huge advantage for her along with industry recognized certifications that she has gotten. And I don't know if you want me to answer questions now or if you'd rather that I wait about the uh, data. Kathy? Yeah, let's, just, let's wait just a moment. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. We've got plenty of time to answer questions. And um, once again, thank you, Diane. And uh, congratulations on, on the great work that you're doing um, in Southern California there. And we are fortunate to be able um, to reach outside of our, our county and our region to, to find models of success. We also have models of success here in Sonoma County and we're, we're very proud of those. Um, and one of those I want to introduce next, which is Allie Green. And Allie's gonna talk about Laguna High School and the work that um, she's doing there, and in particular focus on how she's introducing her students to some early college um, exposure while they're pursuing a career technical education pathway. So, Allie. Awesome, thank you so much, Kathy, and I'm so honored to be here, so thank you so much for that. Give me a sec while I share screen. Um, so, I'm Allie Green, I am the principal, um, I'm the proud principal of Laguna High School in West Sonoma County in Sebastopol. And we talk a lot about why we do what we do. And I love that we started with that question. And so I want to talk a little bit about what a continuation high school is, because not everybody is really comfortable with that, knows what that is. Um, so continuation high schools are intended for students 16 and older who are at risk of not graduating from high school. And I'm going to go over a little bit of our statistics here at Laguna. So for my population and my kids, um, we are about 60-80% low-income students. Um, just to look at the district as a whole, it's about 30 to 40%. So we are significantly higher density of low-income population here. Um, we also have the highest density of foster youth in the district, the highest density of special education students. And we also have a median math level of about fourth grade. And we know that because we invested this year in a math program that is an interactive program where it gives them a diagnostic and then it creates a learning pathway for them to um, remediate their math skills. And so our kids are, they're at, they're at a pretty significant opportunity gap. And we'll talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. 89% um, of my kids want to go to college. And last year, only 6% did go to college. And this is where I'm really excited about this opportunity of early college credit. I'm actually so thankful that Vanessa Luna is here because she's the one who we partnered with on this. Um, early college credit, and you guys already heard Robert talk about this, like it, it's extremely powerful for kids. So kids who, and by the way, early college credit, so any type of credit, college credits that the kids earn while they're still in high school. So kids are significantly more likely to graduate from high school. They're more likely to enroll in college. They're more likely to demonstrate college persistence, which means that they graduate in six to eight years after starting. Um, and these impacts are greater for females, minority students, and low-income students. And so we kind of started here thinking about how we could implement some of that. Um, and what we ended up coming up with was we are going, we are offering to our students um, articulated courses. And what that means is that the course actually belongs to us. It, we own the course. And that's pretty cool for us because Kids don't have to buy books. Kids don't have to kind of navigate that SRJC um, 
they don't have to navigate that system. They're still within our system, but we are having them apply to SRJC in the second semester. We get to walk them through that application process. And for our students, most of whom don't have the resources in order to be able to do that application process by themselves, that's, that's huge. Um, and so our kids will be able to take our course. They'll be able to get all the supports that we offer them here because it's part of our system. Um, and they'll get college credit if they pass the exam at the end. And if they don't get college, if they don't pass the exam, which we don't expect, we expect every single one of our kids will pass the exam um, because we're going to give them the supports and the resources to do that. But it doesn't negatively impact their, um, their, um, their college transcripts. So we're really excited about that. Um, and why we chose, we, what we chose was a computer science 50 class. And we are partnering with a professor at SRJC um, and he's been a phenomenal resource to us. And we have a teacher here. Um, and just keep in mind, like we, I'm not a computer science teacher. I was an English teacher. And the person who's now going to teach the class is a math teacher. So this is not, this is not necessarily where our expertise lies, but we know it's in the best interest of our students. Um, so our teacher is taking the class right now and she is learning how to teach the course, um, partnering with that professor at SRJC um, and so that we can offer it to our kids. And we kind of see it's computer science 50. And so it's um, introductory to web development. And we see this as like a really cool gateway for our kids. And so I included here from SRJC kind of the pathway kids can take. Um, so they are, our kids are gonna be in right here um, in the computer science 50. And so it's the first in this web and mobile front end skills certificate. And then they can go on to multiple different pathways. Um, once they get their their AA over here, they, they, there's a partner program at um, UC Santa Cruz that they can apply to, and they can also go directly into the workforce. So we're really excited that we can give kids the support to have these opportunities while they're still with us using all of the resources that they, we have available to us. And we're really so thankful and so excited that we get to have this because our kids at Laguna, um, like we live at this kind of this juxtaposition, this weird place of a huge opportunity gap because our kids, the kids who come to a continuation high school, like we're not usually the kids who get access to opportunities. Um, we live within this structure of inequities and generally speaking, as school districts, we give more resources to the students who are wealthier, to the students who are the good kids. And I, I hate using that term, and yet it's the term that people in our community kind of use. And we want to we want to give the resources and the opportunities to the kids who need them the most. And, and that's our kids. Our kids need access to innovation and creativity because for our kids the traditional system of education has failed and we need to provide them with something that is exciting and innovative and gives them hope like that's what that's what we do we give them hope that their lives are are going to be improved through education and through career technical education and so we're really amazed and excited at, at the, this open door. And um, so we're really excited. And what our kids really want, and this, this is what they tell us over and over again, um, they really want culinary. So we want to expand this into culinary. They want construction. We are playing with a construction course. And they really want access to an agricultural program. So that's what we're here. And that's what we are. That's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to work with. We're trying to give our kids as many opportunities as possible. That's great, Allie. Thank you again. You can really see and feel that um, students are at the very heart of what you do and what you're trying to create there. And I really appreciate um, you referencing the opportunity gap as opposed to saying the challenge or the barriers um, or their just general gap. So that, that's really wonderful. Okay, so next, uh, our local partner here with the SRJC, Vanessa, 
is going to talk about why, uh, as she spoke in her introduction, she is so intently um, passionate and wanting to break down barriers around these opportunities and really why and how um, the dual enrollment and early college credit is a powerful tool for addressing equity in our schools. Yeah, thank you. And I think this, this lineup is perfect, um, Ali. Um, I'm glad the camera was actually turned off because so much of what you said, I was doing a lot of head nodding and actually saying, yes, yes, absolutely. You know, I've been overseeing, I've been the director of a middle college high school that was uniquely designed to serve alternative education students as emerging adults, 16 to 20 years old, um, that are you have used dual enrollment as an opportunity to accelerate their graduation, um, you know, to expedite that timeline, to be able to earn their high school diploma and simultaneously college credits um, on, and be on a pathway towards um, a, a certificate degree or transfer. And so in particular for that underserved, disadvantaged, vulnerable student population, dual enrollment is such a powerful equity tool in this field. Um, but of course, it, it's not just um, it's not just those, um, you know, kind of uh, the students that need the extra um, assistance, the extra um, support. It's it's all students that really benefit from dual enrollment. And I think what had been mentioned earlier is that, you know, traditionally dual enrollment was an opportunity um, for that was really more known, I would say, with the high achieving, um, you know, college bound um, student and family. And so I'm so glad to see that it's, um, it's a, a phenomenon that's growing, expanding across California community colleges, and um, that through new legislation, we're able to close some of these opportunities and resources gaps that exist so that all students could really be able to participate um, and earn that um, early college credit while they're still in high school, as well as adult school um, towards their high school equivalency programs. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, start sharing my screen as well. And so again, Vanessa Luna Shannon, um, I've been with SRJC for the past seven years and SRJC um, is investing in dual enrollment and other early college credit pathways. And um, so I am transitioning into a position that will be under academic affairs to develop these early college credit pathways and opportunities, including articulation, which you know, Ali's an early partner with this nascent program um, and, um, and dual enrollment um, pathways and partnerships, um, including career and call uh, um, rather college and career access um, pathway partnerships. So um, equity has been talked a lot of been talked about quite a bit today, excuse me. Um, and, you know, I that's really what brings me to this space. Um, I'm an equity advocate and champion. Um, and so, um, in all honesty, CTE and career education is somewhat new. It's a new curve for me, um, but I am excited to bring um, this lens that I work into the framework of career education at SRJC and um, really looking forward to partnering um, with our local um, secondary high schools as well as adult schools in our area. So um, just gonna, some of this is kind of a reiteration of what has been talked about by um, my colleagues here in our webinar. Um, you know, dual enrollment and early college credit pathways really address those opportunity gaps by mitigating barriers um, to access college, the cost of college transportation, guidance in terms of making informed decisions about course selections have been some of the barriers that have been in place traditionally um, that have really um, you know, kind of had dual enrollment and early college credit be somewhat of an exclusive opportunity. And so we're trying to make it as inclusive as possible. Dual enrollment is free or low cost, um, including for undocumented students who aren't eligible for federal and sometimes state financial aid. So it's an efficient path to college credit for all students. Um, it's a great opportunity and option for students who maybe haven't thought about college. Um, again, new legislation is breaking down barriers and accessing early college credit. Some of you may have heard of what is called CCAPS. Again, this is the College and Career Access Pathways. This is something that SRJC is very excited um, to, um, to start um, in their near future. 
Um, we're building towards that um, because CCAPS will allow for college classes to be offered at the high school site, even during the school day. So this means that students who have to work after school or have to care for a sibling or don't have transportation can access college courses and do so for free. We've talked about um, the robust body of evidence that demonstrates that participating in dual enrollment improves student success in high school and in college. For example, compared to similar peers, dual enrollees have higher rates of high school graduation, higher rates of college enrollment, and higher rates of subsequently completing a college degree, a 25% point increase on average, which is pretty extraordinary. So it's a great investment uh, for the student. Um, again, because it's affordable, it's a great investment in terms of time because they're able to um, um, uh, acquire these college credits while they're still in high school, which means it's less time that they would spend post secondary school in college. And it's a great investment for us, for our, the community um, to invest in our students. Um, let me go back to this. I'm actually going to stop sharing for a moment and let you know what is happening at SRJC. Hold on just a moment. I'm trying to stop sharing. For some reason, that's not coming up. Here we go. Thank you. Somebody might have prompted that. So I wanted to just briefly, I know I just have a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to let you know um, what's happening at SRJC um, and some of, the, some of the work that has already been done that's laying the groundwork um, for this partnership in our community. You know, at SRJC in the last academic year, we had approximately 2,000 dual enrollment high school students, which is, a, which is a high rate relative to other community colleges. And that's really because our SRJC outreach team through student services has really been out there, um, you know, bringing uh, matriculation steps, including the registration, um, application, those dual enrollment forms, creating um, early college opportunities, uh, such as field trips, et cetera. Um, directly um, to high schools, even in the virtual world. And so they've really been trying to uh, mitigate some of the challenges that we've had, even um, in distance learning. And so they're still very, very active and out there recruiting students into existing courses that we offer. Um, the focus that we're really going to be having in the next year is, is on bridging the academic infrastructure, such as certificate pathways that high school students can take via articulation Again, what's been mentioned by Diane and by um, Ali at Laguna, um, so that high school students can start taking um, articulated courses that lead towards credit by exam or credit for professional, or rather credit for prior learning. Um, we're also um, looking to uh, have more courses that are designated as dual enrollment courses that can be offered synchronous or asynchronous um, and can still be offered in the distance learning format to keep that accessibility high for our students. So these are some of the things that are happening um, at SRJC and that we're looking to build on. And um, I look forward to your questions and as well as your suggestions. We know that we have a lot of work to do and some time to make up, um, but we're very eager to get that going. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Wow, that was a lot of information. There is some great resources in the chat. Um, we've had some questions, but I, I just wanted to share, I feel like that was so much information. And then um, we are, the staff has been awesome, awesome about adding things into the chat. So, and the question was, can we get the slides? Yes, you will also all get the slides. So I think if it's okay, we'll start with, I know Diane, there was a couple of questions that I think you spotted from Wendy around student success, success data and pathway staff. If we can get those two answered, we'll start there. Absolutely. Um, so first off, I can tell you again, we're in our third midway through our third year of uh, dual enrollment under a CCAP as Vanessa was talking about um, college and career access pathways program. We decided to go with um, and I guess you're a transfer pathway so that students could get some of their general education requirements out of the way and then be able to transfer if that's what they want to do. So that's why we went with math. We started in our first semester with civics and had 17 students. That was a face-to-face -face class. 
And uh, there was a 100% pass rate in that very small cohort of classes. Last year, or the 1920 year, as we all know, something happened. I don't know what it was, but we all sort of <laughs> took shelter during the middle of the year. So our trigonometry pre-calculus class started out as face-to-face -face and then shifted to an online environment or a virtual environment. And regardless, we went from 17 students in the civics class to 120 in the uh, trigonometry pre-calculus class and had a 96% pass rate. Um, so even though there was that sort of blended experience for the students, they still did very well. Um, this school year, only one student out of 130 decided not to go on in the virtual environment. So we're seeing that that is still going on. As far as being on the high school campus, I believe that is an additional help <clears throat> because the high school teachers, although they're adjunct professors, they're teaching the exact same content, same standards, student learning outcomes. <clears throat> they um, have a bit more experience generally with the high school students and the way they respond. And so I think that's helpful for them. Um, and then as far as um, other data, I am putting a link in the chat. Oops, I did it just to the foundation. Let it. Let me do it to everyone. Sorry about that. Um, to a presentation that I was honored to take part in along with Naomi Castro from the Career Ladders Project that we did at the Link Learning Conference in 2019 that looks at data for um, dual enrollment programs around the state and there's a resource in there that you can actually look and see how those are doing. And total coincidence, didn't even know that Vanessa was presenting until yesterday, but there's a shout out in there to the uh, Santa Rosa Junior College dashboard that they do, which was phenomenal. Just love it. So some really good um, information there. I imagine the data differs by district, but we've been very successful with it. So Diane, I have a question because we have uh, heard reference to um, some, what I consider to be high level math uh, when you start talking trig and pre-calc. And we also know, yeah, especially, and then we also heard the data point from you about um, how students are coming into um, the high school system in terms of their um, math achievement levels. And it's a significant challenge when they get to post-secondary and, and realize they need remedial. So I'm just wondering how the model that you've created in your high schools is, is helping students improve those math schools so they're actually uh, succeeding in the higher levels of math. Yes, and actually we have another program that was started uh, through Antelope Valley College, which has been quite successful, not as widespread as we'd like, but very good. It's called, um, used to be called SMAP, now it's called QRAT, Quantitative Reasoning and Advanced Math Topics, which is a, an articulated course. And it covers the um, sub-transfer levels of math. So it, it actually reviews Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry. Many seniors don't take a math class if they're not going on to engineering or healthcare that might include uh, advanced math. So by taking this course, they then are able to get uh, credit, if you will, up to transfer level math, the math 150, I believe it is. Um, and then they're, they're more prepared because if you don't use the math, you tend to lose it. So we have the math support classes all along, and then they can take this course as a senior and it helps prepare them to be able to go on to uh, math uh, that's transfer level or just will help them in their certificate programs. Um, and we do have a lot of engineering. We're also known as the Aerospace Valley. So we have Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, um, space, SpaceX and things like that in our area. So engineering is really big. Students need to be prepared to move on to math. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question for Robert um, that is in reference to the portrait of a graduate or graduate profiles. If really quickly, if you could share, uh, there's a uh, the Sonoma County portrait of a graduate pictured right here behind me. 
Um, if you could just share a little bit about why or how that applies to what we're, we're talking about here in the sense of ensuring students are college and career ready. Thanks, Kathy. Well, I, I think one of the challenges too is having something like a portrait of a graduate so that we're not driven just by the traditional metrics of success uh, in school. Um, and I think having something like what Kathy has behind her where we're elevating things like curiosity and empathy, um, you don't normally see those um, in the standards. They're usually not on our standardized uh, tests. They're usually not measured by the state for accountability. So I think one of the challenges is really reimagining, you know, what we really value in education and what students need. And, you know, we hear a lot about things like learning loss right now, which I think is a, is a real thing. Um, but there's also a lot of things kids are learning that we just aren't measuring right now in terms of resilience and self-management. Um, and, and some of them are learning that uh, a lot better than others. But I think, you know, looking at something like a portrait of graduate, it's really what does the community really think students need to know and be able to do uh, beyond, and, and I'm not, and, and I'm a science teacher, so I, I totally believe in math and, and literacy is, is key, but I don't think that's enough um, for students to really be successful. I, so I think having something like a graduate profile or some different um, competencies that really uh, come from the community, I think, is is really critical. These are things that should be intrinsically driving us, and that are that are created, um, you know, not just by uh, post secondary partners and workforce partners, but you know, parents and students were involved in that process. So I think that's really an authentic way to rethink how and what the purpose of education should be now going forward. And I think that's a challenge because I think there are other metrics that schools and educators um, uh, are driven by that, that are also important, so. Great, I was reading the chat and have to, a little shout out to Tony Crabb, who is actually the founding um, godfather, we'll call him, of the CTE Foundation. So Tony, thank you. And I don't know if you guys saw his message about what are the key challenges in starting the link learning um, and the dual enrollment programs. Can someone speak to that? I feel like that is key and there's probably a lot of questions around that piece. Dane, you wanna take a shot at that? I just I just used up some sure. of your time. Um, <laughs> So um, I agree that it does need to be a mindset shift. And we have always had a district that's very supportive of career and technical education, but also very um, college prep oriented. It had the same dialogue all the time, go to four-year, go to four-year, go to four-year. So we really wanted to have a lot of options for our students. The stu same student could be prepared to go to MIT or go to a technical school, go directly to work, whatever they wanted to do. So. Uh, really making sure that it's not that tracking um, mentality and making sure that we just continue to drip that on all of the site administrators, district administrators. And I must say in our district, we do hear occasionally, not necessarily from administrators, but from others saying, oh yeah, not kids just aren't gonna go to college. They're gonna take CTE, but showing them the rigor of our programs. For example, we have a composite slab at one of our high schools. And that's very important work in aerospace, um, aligning that with the college and just really showing them the high rigor that's required in career and technical education helps change that mindset. Great. Um, what can the community do? We have a lot of community members on here. We have obviously other educators and administrators and uh, philanthropists. And um, I don't know who wants to jump in on this one, but I am going to just open it up. What, what can community do to support this model and making sure that it's successful here in Sonoma County? I think I stumped them. <laughs> Allie, I know, I know you get some community support out in West County. What, what do you need um, for your students in your school to help um, create some, of, bring some of this relevancy in, into their education and learning. You know, we, I, f I do feel like we are so lucky and we have had so much community support at Laguna. Um, and 
you know, I think of anything that we as a community can do, it kind of speaks to Robert's point that like we need to value all knowledge in the acquisition of knowledge as as valuable. And I don't think we necessarily do that. I also think we need to value that different pathways to acquire knowledge are equally valuable. I mean, we talk a lot about CTE versus college and I, and I, one of you guys had said it's, it's a mindset shift and like we need to change that mindset that like what we need to do is acquire skills and those skills are transferable to college or to a career and also just to life. And I do think it's really valuable the time that our kids and our families are spending together right now acquiring skills and becoming better at things that that will have an impact them on them for the rest of their life. Wow, I think that was a, a perfect wrap. What do you think, Lisa? I love the way you summarized that there. And I, yeah, I agree, Kathy. Thank you very much. And um, there's so many questions, but again, we will get back to you if you've asked a question and so uh, grateful to our panelists for sh to share their information. Um, you may be getting some calls and emails and so we appreciate your willingness to do that. I have to say Sonoma County always prides itself on saying they want to be ahead of the game, right? They want to be innovative. So we can do this and we should make this a priority for our young people to um, feel hope. And that word is used a lot now, but that's that's where I always where I end up going back to. So Kathy, I'll leave it to you to wrap it up. But I just want to say thank you to all the panelists and you will be hearing from us and uh, so appreciate the work you do every single day. Absolutely. And uh, I also want to thank again our panelists for joining us here today and to everyone who signed on. Um, we look forward to continuing our engagement. Um, please check our website. Um, there will be a recording of this if you would like to see it again or share or uh, recapture any of the information that was here. And please do uh, plan to join us in the next four weeks, uh, every Thursday at noon, we will be featuring other partnerships in the community that are really important to ensure all of our students' success here.